Hey, deserving listeners, it's just me today. So tomorrow I'm going to give a presentation at a, a conference. It's our local marriage and family therapy chapter conference, and I am going to give a presentation there about using social media to enhance your clinical practice. And I thought I would, as a way to prep for that presentation, I would do a podcast version of the presentation here with you today. This is the Psychology in Seattle podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Kirk Honda. I'm a therapist and a professor. So the presentation that I'm giving has visuals, so I'm not going to have those visuals. So I have to sort of um, modify everything a little bit. But um, I start off with some obligatory stats about how everyone in the world is using social media and the internet and stuff. Um, so in this presentation, um, after going over some of those obligatory stats in the introduction, I'm gonna, I, I'm gonna give a little outline, which is that I'm gonna talk about my experience using the internet to enhance my practice. I'm gonna talk about um, why people use social media and the internet to enhance their practice. I'm gonna talk about some of the ethical concerns. I'm gonna provide some examples and I'm gonna provide my advice. So it all began for me 10 years ago. At the time I was practicing for about 11 years, 12 years. And I was, my, I was in private practice and my, my practice was doing well, but I wasn't working exactly with the population that, that I wanted to work with. Um, I mainly at that point had progressed to a point where I really liked working with, shall we say, self-actualizing adults and couples in conflict. Up until that point, I had been working with children, you know, age three on up, teenagers and families and adults going through various different issues for various different presenting problems. But by that point, and I loved doing all that work, but by the point I was 12 years in-ish, I remember thinking, you know, I really love working with adults who are going through self-actualization issues or are recovering from trauma or are ha going through relationship issues or, um, you know, infidelity, um, just that sort of stuff. And I also really loved working with couples of various different, you know, issues. Usually it's, you know, they're in conflict. And so I was trying to figure out a way to actually uh, work with that population more. And I thought, well, the only way I can actually do that is, a, is if I somehow raise demand for my service. If, if more people know about me, more people will contact me and I will therefore have a better chance of being able to pick and choose who I want to work with. Also, if I promote certain things about my clinical practice, maybe um, people will hear about that and will hire me because of that. So I was trying to figure out a way, well, you know, how do I raise demand for my, uh, for my service and awareness of my service? And, um, I, cause I hadn't really done anything up until that point, you know, I hadn't really done any marketing at all. And so I was like, I wonder if there's something I could do. The other thing was, um, I've been teaching at Antioch for 20 years. And at that time, 10 years ago, 2008, I actually wasn't teaching at Antioch for a couple years. I was taking a break. And so at the time I remember distinctly that I had this urge to teach. I, I had a, you know, there was this itch that I wanted to be scratched and, I didn't have any uh, way that I knew of that I could actually get that need met. Also, I am a musician, as some of you know, and I've been in various different uh, musical out, uh, outfits since I was um, a kid, really. Um, and at the time, 2008, I wasn't in any band. I was sort of in between bands. Umberto and I had been in a band um, until like mid-2008, I believe. And uh, the band, uh, for various reasons, had to split up. And so I didn't have a way of um, creating. I, I wanted, I had all these creative needs that I wanted to get out, and I was looking for something to satisfy that need. Also, since I was in private practice and not teaching at Antioch, and I didn't have a consultation group, I felt very isolated. I didn't have any other colleagues that I was talking to. I was alone and I felt like, you know, 
day in and day out, I was working with my clients that I didn't really have an easy way to talk with other people. I certainly had friends like Bob Gettle and them that I could uh, con uh, consult with, but I wanted it to be more regular. Also at the time, Barack Obama was running for president and I, you know, there's this sense in the air of, of hope and change, right? You know, you could argue as to whether or not that was legit or not, but at the very least it felt like something was happening that a African-American man was a, a, you know, a candidate for president. And I actually didn't think he was going to win. I, I thought that racism would win out on that one. But um, so at the time, you know, uh, August 2008, I was like, you know, July 2008, I was like, you know, this is, this is pretty exciting. And, and I, I want to be a part of it somehow. I, and I, I was 37 at the time. And so I thought um, that maybe it was time in my life that I actually participated in the discourse um, in society around political issues. Also at the time there, I, I was, I was really um, in love with podcasts. I was listening to This American Life. I was listening to Skeptic's Guide to the Universe. And I was listening to the Astronomy Podcast, I think it's called. And I just loved it because I, I loved audiobooks prior to that. Um, the first audiobook I heard was late 90s, and it was on a cassette tape, and I, it was Cool Hand Luke. Someone gave it to me. They were just like, you know, since you don't really like reading books, maybe you'll like listening to fictional books. And so listening to Cool Hand Luke, I was just like, oh, my God, this is great. And then I listened to um, Harry Potter on actual tape. And then I listened to, um, uh, what else? Did I, oh, I listened to the Game of Thrones books uh, prior, you know, way prior to the TV show. And the uh, the way that you could sort of enter the world of the writer and everything, I just loved it. And then when podcasts came out, because I've always liked talk radio, but I, and I always liked NPR, but I didn't like the fact that you had to tune in at a particular time. You had to be in your car at a particular time. And when podcasts came out, I was just like, oh my God, this is great. And I started naturally to look to psychology and psychotherapy podcasts. And at the time, to my knowledge, and I'm pretty sure it, this is the way that it was, there were really only three psychology podcasts. There was Dr. Dave's podcasts, uh, the Shrink Wrap Radio, which is still going on, there was um, uh, Michael Britt's, Michael Britt? I think that's his name. His podcast called Psych Files, The Psych Files. And um, H Howie, uh, his podcast, I can't remember the name of it. But anyway, there, there were these three podcasts. And I would listen to them and I thought it was great. You know, I was learning about different psychology things and and it was great to just be, it felt like I was being connected with other clinicians. And I thought to myself, wow, I wonder if I made a podcast, if I could get all those needs met, you know, I could raise demand for my, um, for my practice. I could be, you know, get a creative need met. I could get a teaching need met. I could not be isolated anymore. I could, you know, perhaps try to make a tiny difference, a positive difference in the world. And I thought maybe a podcast would actually help with that. The other thing I thought was, if I make the crappiest podcast about psychology, um, it will still be the fourth best psychology podcast of its time. <laughs> I remember specifically thinking that. It's like, well, I don't know how to make a podcast. And I I'm sure, and I, I don't, at the time when I, it's, at the time I had no confidence in that sort of thing. Like I just thought, how do you make something that's interesting? How do you talk into a microphone? How do you think straight? How do you um, think of ideas? How do, how do you pace it? How do you not stutter? How do you not you know, freak out and forget what you're supposed to say? But I also said to myself, well, if it goes terrible, again, it's the fourth best psychology podcast. <laughs> And so I started a podcast called Psychology in Seattle, as you know, and I had no idea, no idea what I was doing. There were a lot of setbacks in the beginning, just daily setbacks and daily barriers to overcome. No one was listening for a long period of time. And 
uh, for years, really. Very few people were listening. In fact, if any of you out there started listening back then, shoot me an email, email because I suspect that according to, you know, my just anecdotal um, evidence, all of our current listeners are fairly recent, you know, like in the past maximum, like four years, you know, maybe five years. But we've been doing this podcast for 10 years. And, and so I, I'm curious if any of you out there started listening to us back then. I mean, even if you weren't a consistent listener, I'd be really curious because one, I don't think any of people like that exist. And two, I'd be interested to hear your perspective about how the podcast has changed over the years because, you know, it's pretty different now. But anyway, so in the beginning, no one was listening. And I started it with my two best friends, Umberto and Lita. And um, for some reason, I just kept at it because it was it was fun. It was interesting. It was a challenge. Uh, the little bit of, of response I got from people was just enough to keep me going. And then fast forward 10 years, and we've done almost 800 episodes, and I've spent... I, I've kept track or I've estimated how much time I've spent on the podcast and I've spent over 6,000 hours on the podcast in 10 years. And this is above and beyond my regular job as a clinician, supervisor, and instructor and administrator at the university. So this is all like free time, right? So 6,000 hours of free time, essentially, that I've spent over the past 10 years. And, you know, so over the years, and not so much lately, but the first, I don't know, five, six, seven years, whenever I told someone I was doing a podcast, they would say, why? Why are you doing it? Like, what's the purpose? And back then, I the podcast wasn't making any money. And so I, I'd have to just say, I, I, I don't know, I just like it. So I thought that I would uh, think about and come up with different reasons why someone would do a podcast or why someone would have a YouTube channel, why someone would put effort into building a Twitter audience or a Instagram audience or um, that kind of thing. You know, why do we as clinicians do that? Why do we spend our time and effort on doing that? And so I have 12, 12 reasons here. Number one is to get clients, as I set out to do originally with this podcast. Um, when you build an audience, people know about you, you come across like an expert, and plus people might like you. They might say like, oh, okay, I know that person. I listen to that person's podcast, or I watch that person's YouTube videos. Or you know, they get a referral of four or five names, and they Google all the names, and all, you know, most of people don't have a social media presence. And so if you do, then you, you know, you stand out to the consumer. They're like, oh, okay, well, uh, now if your content is terrible, then they'll be turned off by you. But if your content seems to mesh up well with the person, then I, I think they're more likely to contact you. Another thing is um, you can use the uh, podcast or Twitter or what Instagram to enhance your current clients. You can actually send encouraging uh, notions or, you know, I do podcasts on various different issues. And if my uh, clients listen to the podcast, I imagine that some episodes would, act would actually enhance my treatment of them. Number two is to get supervisees, similar thing with clients. And you can actually use your social media internet presence to enhance uh, in between your supervision meetings. You know, like if with me, my supervisees, I'll, I'll assign episodes about ethical things instead of me using time that they have to pay for because you know they pay me for supervision time instead of me using that time it's like well they can listen to me you know run run off at the mouth um during different podcast episodes and i some of my supervisees um listen to the podcast for sure number three is to promote something you as us as clinicians sometimes we have things to promote um and or you have friends that are promoting things and you can use your uh, social media presence, your audience that you've built to promote things. For example, many of you know, I've promoted a number of things over the years on the podcast. I've promoted uh, Laura Grant Gransberry's Open Your Practice, um, a, a, a course that she teaches for novice people in private practice. I've um, promoted Rebecca Bloom's art therapy books. I've promoted Paulette Perhatch's stuff, her book. I've pr promoted 
Bob Gettle's practice. Um, I've promoted, you know, lots of different things, lots of, you know, different authors and this kind of stuff. I've uh, promoted my own book, uh, Multi-Role Clinical Supervision. I'm fairly certain that my book would not be selling much at all unless I had an audience um, for this podcast. And to all the you out there who have bought the book, thanks a lot. If, if that's who, you who... I get reports that, you know, certain amount of book sales every month or something. And so I assume it's you out there. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, number four is to help your career. It can, you know, if you are known as an expert on social media or, you know, you're getting interviewed or this sort of thing, it can enhance your resume. It can help you to make make you look more like an expert. You know, if you're applying for a job at an eating disorder place and you're somewhat well known on social media as an expert on eating disorders, then I would imagine that that would make it more likely for an employer to hire you. And for me, because I, I haven't had to apply f- for a job for a long time, so uh, it's not really, that's not really a concern for me. But the main thing for me is that it diversifies my career activities. For example, I have my private practice with my clients. I have my private practice with my supervisees. I teach. Um, I'm an instructor at a university, and I'm also an administrator at the university. A lot of people forget about that part of my job. Honestly, they'll, they'll, you know, they'll ask me, um, you know, so how many, you know, what did you do today? And I'll be like, oh, you know, I was at the university, and they'll be like, oh, so you're teaching? And I was like, oh no, I was in meetings and paperwork and outcomes and surveys and you know, and meetings and more meetings and. and uh, People are kind of surprised by that. I, I think you know, when you're a high school teacher or elementary school teacher, the vast majority of your time is spent in class teaching. For sure, you do other kinds of things, right? Correcting papers and development and that kind of stuff. But the ratio is much more heavy on the teaching side. Well, university teaching, the ratio is much more on the administrative side. Like I teach uh, ne- this quarter, uh, this we do, we do quarters in the Northwest for some reason. Everyone else does semesters, but we do quarters. And this quarter, fall quarter, is for me, I'm, te- I'm teaching one class and it's just three hours a week. So, and the, the gig is a full-time gig. So just three hours, I'm just spending three hours a week teaching the rest of the time is administrative stuff. Anyway, that was a jag that I won't do when I'm doing my actual presentation. I can go off on tangents on the podcast, you know, version of the presentation, can't I? I mean, come on. Um, so, yeah, I I have all these different things that I do in my week. I have my private practice, supervision, teaching, administration at the university, and I have this podcast. And the podcast involves a lot of different things. It involves, you know, preparation. It involves talking like now. It involves posting stuff. It involves interviewing other people. It involves like website stuff. And so I threw out and I do all those things every week. And so I'm never bored because there are so many different activities that I'm doing. And if I was doing any one of those activities, I assume I'd get bored. And it, when I was in private practice 10 years ago, and that was all I was doing. I wasn't teaching. I wasn't at the university. I wasn't. I hadn't podcasted yet. Um, I uh, was just doing private practice, and I only needed to do about twenty five clients a week to make a good living. And so I was just working twenty five hours a week. And so that was another issue as to why I started the podcast was I just had tons of free time because because in private practice you have virtually no paperwork and so I was and I had a home office so I didn't have a commute so I literally worked 25 hours a week and that was maybe 26 you know if you count like a little bit of emailing or something and that's all I needed to work and yet and and that was the goal of my the first 10 years of my career was like get to that point where I'm you know all I'm so I have a strong private practice and that and I have a good set of clients that are with insurance companies that pay well and private practice or private pay and all that kind of stuff and I finally arrived there and I thought okay this is the rest of my life and then after a couple of years of that I was like huh this is getting a little wearisome I mean I loved all my clients and I loved the work but it just felt like it was like kind of like being in a rut where you're doing the same thing every every day. And so when I, uh, at, you know, fast forward a year, 
um, into 2009, and I was actually teaching again at Antioch, and it, I was an administrator, and uh, I had superv- supervisees, and I was doing the podcast, and I've had that sort of career for the past nine years, and I I never get bored, I never get upset about work, um, I know. Ne- I never dread my work day. It's um, having that div- diversity really helps anyway. So that's another reason to use uh, social media in, to enhance your practice. Number five is to get continuing education credit. In my state, uh, and I'm guessing in other states, you can count up to six hours of your continuing education as in other activities that advance your professional competence. So doing a podcast, I've done, you know, several deep dives, as you know, I just did a a 13 hour deep dive on suicide. So, and the research involved in that, and then the um, production of the episodes were absolutely um, advancing of my professional competence. And so, uh, but I do stuff like that all the time. I do deep dives on various different issues. Um, different figures in the field and that sort of thing. So, um, so I absolutely count that as continuing education credit. Number six is to make money. Uh, it's not easy to make money to uh, by you know using social media to enhance your practice, clinical practice. But it's definitely possible. And um, I uh, very slowly just you know trudging away <laughs> over the past ten years have managed to finally. Um, produce some revenue and uh but you know for the first seven eight years i made nothing in fact i paid money to do the podcast i there were expenses you know internet expenses equipment expenses certainly time expenses and i did it for free because i um, loved it and it um, met a lot of other needs that i had and um anyway so so the thing I like to tell people when I'm giving advice about this sort of thing is is two things. Is one is is that you don't need to make money doing this in order for it to meet your needs. And two, there actually is a way to make money if you build enough of an audience. And so both are true that, you know, you don't need to make money if you have the sort of needs that can be met through it. But at the same time, if you'd work it right, you can actually it can actually be part of your income. Number seven is to get connected. It's another reason to use social media and the internet uh, to enhance your practice. I, like I said, 10 years ago, felt isolated. I had my you know, family and friends, but I felt disconnected from other clinicians. And uh, doing this podcast has connected me to so many people, including Irvin Yalom, for example. <laughs> um, but all the live shows and all the interviewees that I've had, all the co-hosts that have been on the show. Uh, it's, it's been a, if I, if I had an, an overarching word that would exemplify my experience with all this stuff is connection, just feeling connected. Like right now I'm talking into this microphone, I'm alone in a room, but after meeting so many people at the live shows, I have this very visceral sense that there are people out there listening and and then I'll get emails from people from around the world, you know, about different episodes. Um, on uh, our, there's various different places where you can look at stats as to who is listening to the podcast. And uh, I'm looking at the graph right now. And there's only like, I don't know, 10 countries in the world that we don't have listeners. Uh, it says North Korea is one of the countries. Um, yeah, there's like there's like a few countries in the in the Western Africa that, for whatever reason, we don't have any listeners there. But every other country around the world, not just the English speaking countries, you know, all of South America, looks like all of Asia, um, and a lot of parts of of Africa. You got the Middle East, you got you got Europe, and and I get emails from people around the world all the time. In fact, I have, an, I have an hypothesis that people in other countries are more likely to email me because uh, when I look at stats, like, you know, the, something like two thirds of our listeners are in the United States. And yet, like half of the emails I get are from people from other countries. <laughs> um, I'm not exactly sure why I have some hypotheses. Um, 
So anyway, uh, so another reason to use social media to enhance your clinical practice is to get connected. And I definitely do feel connected. Every morning I wake up, I, you know, t- talking to Irvin Yalom, he says he, he did this. And I, so I felt um, somehow uh, akin to him on some level, but I wake up in the morning, I, you know, get my stuff ready. And then I go to the computer and I look to see who has emailed me and I respond to emails. Uh, it's, it's just really great to interact with people in this way, people that are interested in the same things that I am. Number eight is to raise our profile as clinicians. Um, a lot of people have a bad view of us. A lot of people don't know we exist or they don't know what we, are, what we do. I get emails from people all the time that are like, you know, I tried therapy once. I didn't really like it. But after listening to your podcast, I realized that there's a lot of different kinds of therapists out there. And so I'm going to seek therapy again. And um, so we need to do that because, one, um, the public is in dire need of more mental health care. And the less of a barrier there is, the better. Um, But also, you know, we want to make money. We want to make a living out of this job. And so when people know about us, they hire us, you know, they're more likely to hire us. Number nine is to help your organization. You don't just have to help your uh, practice, but, you know, you can use it to help a larger organization that you're part of. I am board president of a nonprofit called Game to Grow. You know, we've done a number of episodes on that, and I've promoted Game to Grow a lot. But um, really, our whole, everyone in our organization uses social media a lot. They're all, all the board members, all the um, employees of Game to Grow are, are very good at, at social media. And so, uh, and a big part of the success of Game to Grow has to do with um, their ability to use social media to, to raise awareness and to get people to get excited about the nonprofit. I also was, uh, as you know, program director. I used to be program director of the Couple and Family Therapy Program at Antioch University, Seattle. And during that time, I used a lot of social media to try to uh, raise awareness. And I'm still doing that. Um, And I I had a podcast called The Couple and Family. The podcast is still available if you're interested in it. It's called The Couple and Family Therapy Podcast. For those of you who listen to Psychology in Seattle, there's I use some episodes for that podcast. I just sort of added a different um, introduction. But there's something like 40 episodes, and I interviewed in, instructors and students about their work. And um, it's a good way for prospective students and people in the community to get to know the program. So, um, you know, if, if you're looking at different programs, different education programs, and the uh, you know, you look at the website, you read the pamphlet, you talk to the admissions counselor, um, you know, all that can be helpful. But imagine being able to listen to 40 hours of interviews with faculty and students. It would be, you'd very much get a clear picture of what this program was all about, right? And so um, so using podcasts or YouTube videos or or even a Twitter account or something can definitely enhance your organizations. And and for some of you out there, you act, you absolutely do this all the time, right? You probably, but I find a lot of clinical folks don't do this um, because of just the way that clinical people tend to be. But of course, some of you out there aren't clinicians and you work for a startup, for example, and no startup it can get going without uh ample and adequate and competent use of social media. Uh, number 12, uh, or no, sorry, going back to the 12 reasons, number 10 is to learn things. I have learned so much from doing this podcast. I have learned, I mean, I 90% of probably what I know clinically has come from this podcast. I have two master's degrees and a doctorate degree, and the amount of learning I've done in 10 years of podcasting easily is is 10 to 20 times more important than, um, you know, from doing the podcast than it was from uh, getting my degrees. Uh, 
also when I was getting my doctorate degree, I was doing the podcast. And so I would use um, stuff I was learning in class for content. And it sort of helped me to solidify the knowledge to, um, to do that. You know, I've done episodes on narcissism, borderline, histrionic, ethics, legal issues, nausea, OCD, cultural bound syndromes, coaching, self-disclosure, gender, racism, confidentiality, EFT, psychodynamic, hypochondria, suing a counselor, repression, PTSD, complex PTSD, how to document, how to be competent, Winnicott, passive aggressive personality, Viktor Frankl, paraphilias, abandonment, narrative therapy, online therapy, parapsychology, family of origin work, malpractice, adoption, the dark triad, adult ADHD, mandated reporting, trauma, and so on. You know, that's just the list of 30-ish things. And, you know, whenever I do an episode, I do at least an hour or two of prep, if not several months of prep. And, you know, like my um, recent deep dives on narcissism and suicide, were essentially like mini dissertations, honestly. So the so emerging from those deep dives, I I just feel like a super expert now, and I have my notes that I kept, you know, and I can you know years later go back to those notes. Sometimes, honestly, this sounds narcissistic, and it probably is, but I'll actually listen to old episodes, old deep dives that I've done to remind me what I used to know, because you know. The brain can only, uh, you know, hold on to so much, retain so much, and so sometimes I'm like, okay, I did a, I did a whole episode on this and that. Um, I'll listen to that again, and I'll, I'll, re, I'll be reminded as, as to what I learned. Um, and I've, I've learned a lot from people I've interviewed as well. You know, just interviewing people, and people about evolutionary psychology or Alzheimer's or cults or religion and just learn so much from them. It's a, it's a wonderful excuse to interview people. You know, you run into people at a dinner party and, you know, there's just a little bit of banter, but often what I really want to do with people at dinner parties is just sit them down and have them on a podcast for half an hour. Cause I, I, there's a way of that uh, the podcasts allow me to ask just a lot of questions that I'm always really curious about other people. Anyway, Number 11 is to have fun. It's, it can be really fun to use social media, you know, Pinterest, Tumblr, Instagram, uh, Snapchat, um, the internet, YouTube, podcasting, blah, blah, blah. It can be a lot of fun. And that was probably the, one of the main reasons that sustained me through the first number of years uh, when I wasn't making any money um, was just how fun it is. It's just a, it's just a blast to do. And um, again, with all the live shows and the different get-togethers we've had with people who listen to the show, it's, it's, just, it's just a blast. And the 12th and last reason I want to point out that people would use social media to enhance their practice is to make the world a better place. On the podcast, I have advocated for a lot of things. I don't think I realized how much the podcast could be that until more recently, but I've, from the beginning, been advocating for a lot of things, you know, client rights, compassion for others, self-compassion, not stigmatizing things, being aware of burnout, uh, rights for students, social justice, equal rights, environmentalism, immigrant rights, gay rights, grief awareness, um, misogyny awareness, victims' rights, this, you know, just the list goes on and on. And the you know so while you're enhancing your practice you can actually be you know trying to make the world a better place in whatever way you can and i f think that the internet needs needs more voices like that there's a lot of different voices on the internet and i think there's not enough voices that are both entertaining and social justice oriented also uh since raising money for the podcast We've also uh, allocated a lot, thousands of dollars, to different charities that we support, including Plymouth Housing Group, which provides homes to people in need, Camp Ten Trees, which is a, a camp for queer youth, the Trevor Project, which 
helps to reduce suicide among queer youth, and Pet Finder, which um, uh, hooks up and you know pets who are planned to be euthanized with homes that need them. That's where I got my cats from. Um, and also, uh, more re- so in the line in line with making a difference in the world. Recently, at the at the most recent um, live show last month, there was a um, a family that came up to us and said that the podcast had helped to bring them back together. They had a falling out, uh, and the podcast helped to um, bring them back together. I'm I'm sure the podcast had very little to do with it. I'm sure it mostly had to do with them and their resilience and their choices that they made. But the fact that you know the podcast could be a part of that, even if it was a tiny part, is tremendously meaningful to me. You know, the the idea that the podcast could actually help people is um you know just overwhelming and really gives a tremendous amount of meaning to to this work i mean this is that's the main reason why i went into this field to begin with because i wanted to make a positive difference in the world and so to be able to say that um this podcast has done that is is just a huge deal to me okay so let's take a break and when we get back we'll continue this conversation Okay, we're back from the break. So the rest of this talk, um, let's get into it. Um, This is the point when I'm actually going to ask the audience how they are using social media to enhance their practice. And I'll have a little discussion there. So think amongst yourselves out there in podcast land. Also, I'm going to ask people if they want to and they're not, what barriers they think there are. Um, So we're... I'll probably address some of the barriers. Okay, so let's get into the ethical concerns. I have 12 here. In the um, in the presentation, I'm going to rip through the 12 because I just feel like it's not really the purpose of my presentation, but I feel like it needs to be mentioned. I, I think people are interested in at least getting a rundown. So number one is do no harm. We, uh, if we're doing work on the internet, we don't want to harm our clients or the treatment of our clients or the public. For example, you don't want to self-disclose uh, about certain issues that might harm treatment with your clients. Number two is confidentiality. Obviously, you don't talk about your clients, or if you do, you mask identity sufficiently. Also, you don't want to say things on social media like, and I see this all the time, honestly, from people. They'll post things on Facebook saying things like, Oh, I had the worst client today. And it's like, uh, no, you can't, you can't do that. <laughs> That's unethical. If your client comes up, comes across that, even if you even if it's not the client you were talking about and they think it's about them, that's harmful to that client. It's an ethical violation. Number three is the idea of multiple relationships. By definition, if you're going to have a internet presence, you are engaging in potential dual relationships with your clients your clients will have a one a relationship with you at you know they'll see you as their therapist but if they find you on social media they will also have a relationship with you through your social media and although dual relationships are not inherently a ethical violation you just need to consider uh things as you go so that it doesn't harm the client or the treatment number four is informed consent you need to inform your clients and your supervisees prior to working with them that you are a presence on the internet because you don't want them to be shocked when they discover you accidentally and that because it could harm them. I, I can't imagine it being that big of a deal to people, but um, at the very least, I just it's not hard to inform people. So in my disclosure statement, I inform people that I have a media and social media presence. And I also say that I will never um, friend them on, um, you know, uh, that's in, in Facebook and that kind of stuff. And also that I will never talk about them on in social media that because um, I want people not I don't want people to worry that I'm going to turn around and talk about them in social media. Number five is disclaimers. Um, you know, when necessary, things like 
you know, this podcast is not a substitute for therapy or if you are thinking about suicide, make sure you, you know, do this or that. So, you know, disclaimers uh, are, are can be useful. But I don't, honestly, I, I find that a lot of podcasts and other um, social media clinicians will use too many disclaimers, honestly. I mean, they can't hurt, obviously. But I find a lot of clinicians are overly paranoid about that sort of thing. I mean, the thing that, that a big... Uh, worry I suppose that people have is like, well, what if someone is watching this YouTube video that I made about PTSD and they think that all that they need to do is watch this video and not go to therapy? And I, and I always think, well, what's the chance that someone is going to be that way? <laughs> like, it's not likely that someone is going to mistake YouTube for therapy, you know? So, um, and if they did, is that your fault that they did? So, but, you know, some people have disclaimers. I usually don't because I don't think that it's, um, I don't think it's a risk. Number six is understanding professional relationships. If you're going to be on social media, you have to understand the difference between a client and someone who's following you on social media. You, and make sure that people understand which category they're in. Again, it's not hard to understand. I doubt anyone listening to my podcast thinks that they are my client, um, unless they are my client. But um, I doubt that people, you know, mistake what that role is. But, you know, you just want to think about that. The other thing is being careful about offering advice that are that is clinical, um, like... If you're in this situation, this is what you should do. It's it's hard to do that because you don't necessarily know what somebody, how they're going to take it or if they're really interpreting it right or if it's good advice for them particularly. So um, you just should be careful about that. But at the same time, you don't, want, you don't need to be paranoid about such things. Um, I don't know about any cases of people on social media getting successfully sued over those kinds of things. Um, you know, as long as the advice isn't terrible, you know, then I'm guessing you're fine. Uh, but at the same time, you just want to make sure that you're um, on the ball and that you're providing sound um, discussions. That's part of the reason why this podcast takes a long, always a long time for me is because there's a lot of prep. I can't just turn on the microphone and talk because if I do, by, experience, by personal experience, is I will at times talk out of my ass. And if I don't have my notes in front of me, if I haven't prepped uh, sufficiently, um, I will say things that later on I'll be like, you know, Kirk, you didn't, you don't really know that, and you just, um, you just said something that wasn't necessarily true, or you don't know it's true. And actually, if you're a listener to the podcast, you'll know, you'll probably know when I slip into that. I, I very rarely will do that in in uh, psychological clinical areas because. Um, I sort of know when I'm stepping into that. But areas like um, if I'm talking about politics or I'm talking about um, cultural things, <laughs> um, there are things that I, I'm not an expert on. I'm not, I'm not a, a, a scholar about. And it will show, and especially if you're in the know on such things. And so, um, so I try to limit that for sure. And uh, you just want to do the same. Number seven is, um, and but just going back to that, is that um, other people who are on the internet who are not representing themselves as a clinician can ramble about whatever they want to because they're, they don't, they're not held to an ethical code or a professional standard about such things, whereas we are. And so um, that's why we have a, a higher standard that we have to follow when we are presenting ourselves in public. It's a burden for sure, but it's um, justified, I think. Number seven, uh, ethical concern is documentation. If a client contacts you through social media, through Instagram or Twitter or something, technically speaking, you have to document that. Number eight is advertising. Just don't lie as you advertise things on your social media. Number nine is testimonials. We can't solicit testimonials from clients. Uh, it's, it's unethical. Number 10 is scope of practice. You want to stay in your lane. You want to stay in the lane that you are competent in. You want to avoid providing medical advice, for example, if, if you don't know anything about that. Uh, uh, you know, Dr. Oz got in big trouble for 
um, you know, talking about things he didn't know about. And of course, never diagnose from afar. Number 11 is make sure that you're competent in being a clinician who uses social media. So you want to, uh, for example, go to trainings like the one I'm providing right now. You want to read stuff on it. You want to understand the ethics and the, you know, just everything. So um, you have to make sure you're competent in doing that. And of course, number 12, the most important ethical concern of all is to never poke your clients on Facebook. Okay, at this point, I'm going to uh, ask for questions. So I guess email me your questions at contact at psychologyinseattle.com. Okay, so I want to give some examples of clinicians who are using the internet uh, to enhance their practice. I have three examples here. The first example I have is Katie Morton. She is a LMFT. She's a licensed marriage and family therapist in California, and she got her master's degree in 2009. So back, so before Katie Morton came on the scene, uh, Katie Morton mainly is a YouTube person. So before she came on the scene, uh, videos on YouTube were the, the vast majority, if not all related to psychology were extremely boring and few and far between. And a lot of them, and I remember watching these, were uh, just videos of a lecture that, you know, some psychology person would be lecturing at a university and someone would put a video camera on a tripod in the back of the room and they just film, you know, an hour and a half lecture. And a lot of times, like the first 20 minutes would be like dead air or like an introduction that you don't need to hear. And the, um, the video would be, just be boring and long. And, but I'd watch them because, you know, this is like, well, I got to, I want to get connected to that. So, um, but then Katie Morton came along in 2012. She started posting things on YouTube. And she, if, if you're aware of her, uh, you know what I'm talking about. But if you're not, go to, go to her page, Katie Morton on YouTube. She, um, you know, talks right in, she, she's like all the other good YouTubers by uh, speaking directly into the camera. She's really close to the camera. She has, you know, sufficient lighting. Um, she uh, looks like she showered that day. <laughs> you know, everything, you know, it's a good presentation. The videos are short. They're, you know, five to 10 minutes long. Um, they're, they're on a particular topic. She tries to keep it real short and sweet. Um, and so she, you know, pretty quickly because of her uh, ability to use YouTube became pretty big over time. And uh, she, I, if I just looked at her YouTube page and it looks like she makes about um, a video every other day on different, different topics. She has a, a Twitter account that I'm guessing she uses to enhance her YouTube following or to interact with people uh, more, you know, minute to minute. And she has a lot of followers there. Um, she tweets funny things. She tweets clinical things. She has a YouTube page, of course. She has a Pinterest page. She has a Tumblr. She has a website where she sells merch. She has a forum on her website. She has a Patreon. So... Um, so this is all just me investigating her, stalking her online. But from what I can tell, she has a practice in California. She has a successful YouTube channel. She has a website, a Twitter, Facebook, Tumblr, Merch, Pinterest. She has a Patreon. And I, it looks like she gets hired as a speaker sometimes. And so um, now this is, I, I'm estimating how much money she's making per month. I, I'm just totally guessing here because I have no idea. Um, I probably should just email her and ask. But um, she, it looks like she probably spends one or two days a week on her various different social media. Look, I'm guessing most of her time is spent on her YouTube channel. Not sure. So one or two days a week, maybe more, maybe less. Um, I'm guessing she's making about $5,000 revenue per month mainly from her Patreon and her YouTube channel. Because, you know, on YouTube, it you get ads, you know, YouTube. So my, my YouTube channel isn't very big because all of our podcasts are just audio. So it doesn't really lend itself to YouTube. I post it on YouTube anyway, because um, back in the day, people were like, please post on YouTube, because that's where I consume most of my things, which always kind of 
confused to me. It's like, why don't you use, just use podcast apps on your phone? But anyway, you know, accommodate the customer. And so um, on, uh, on YouTube, you just make the setting and it, it puts ads in and you get revenue from that. And Patreon, if you're not familiar, is when people sign up as a monthly subscriber where they give, you know, a certain amount of money every month. And so according to what I can tell from, uh, from what is available to me, I think Katie Morton makes about $5,000 per month. Um, maybe more, maybe two to three times more than that. I'm not, not quite sure. And this is beyond her practice, right? And so, and she, you know, she, she's, she's just a regular therapist who has learned how to use YouTube well. And um, if you're out there, a clinician who is thinking about doing this sort of thing, um, this is available to you. There's so few of us that are doing stuff like this that um, there's a there's a there's a lot of demand for it. So um, so uh, so I I gave my 12 reasons as to why I use social media to enhance my practice. But just looking at Katie Morton, I'm guessing she gets clients from her you know from people being aware of her. Um, if she wants to, I, I don't know if California allows for this, but she could probably use her work as continuing edu- education credit. Um, she's definitely making money. She's probably feeling connected. She's raising awareness for clinicians, particularly MFTs. She's probably learning things if she's anything like me. She looks like she's having a blast. She looks like she's having fun. And I think she's making the world a better place by um, disseminating good information. So that's Katie Morton. Um, so I hope that I, I provide this example of Katie Morton as a inspiration for, for you out there to get involved. Um, I would have thought by, so when I started my podcast in 2008, uh, podcasts were pretty um, unknown. Like I remember uh, I would tell people, oh, I'm working on my podcast a bit, huh? What's that? Well, today everyone knows what a podcast is. Most people still don't really listen to podcasts. Um, Many people do, of course, but most people don't really like audio or they don't know how or they, um, they, it, they're just not interested for whatever reason. And so, um, uh, why am I telling you that? Oh, I thought that, um, so about five years ago when podcasts really started to, you know, get popular, like, um, Adam Carolla's podcast or Serial or, you know, all these different other podcasts. Um, I thought that by now, 2018, there would be, just hundreds of high quality psychology related podcasts. And I don't think that there are, I don't, I I don't think there are enough. I mean, you have podcasts like the hidden brain and some people call invisibilia a a psychology podcast. I mean, radio lab certainly goes into psychology sometimes, but I just don't think there's a lot or enough um, interesting podcasts about psychology. In a way, if you look at, the landscape of like pure psychology podcasts, the landscape is pretty similar to the way it was 10 years ago. And I think that's because clinicians, academics, psychologists don't um, think that they can do that or there's just some barrier. And so I'm hoping with this talk that if you're one of those people that you will be given the tools or the inspiration to venture into this area because there, there needs to be more. In fact, after a few years of doing this podcast, I had a fantasy that other people would start podcasts in their cities called like psychology in Austin or psychology in New York or psychology in Miami. And I thought like every city would have its own podcast about psychology. I, I don't know why, I thought that, but I just thought, you know, maybe this will, you know, it'll become this sort of brotherhood and sisterhood among us all over the world, having different podcasts in our particular towns. I don't know. Anyway, so that's Katie Morton. She's a regular MFT, marriage and family therapist in California with a camera who talks into it. And, um, you know, she's having fun, making money, getting connected uh, diversifying her activities, you know, it's, it's, it's not difficult to do. If I can do it, um, you know, I'm telling you, anybody can. So uh, a more down to earth example for people. So, so if you're one of those people out there who 
isn't doing anything on social media. You're just like, oh, it's, you know, I, I'm not doing anything. You know, I, I kind of use Facebook, sort of. Well, I have an example here of Christy Labardi. She is a LMFT in Austin, Texas. Christy Labardi. And she has a Twitter of about 5,000 followers. For those of you who know Twitter, um, that's not, you know, it's nothing to shake a stick at, 5,000 followers. It's not a lot, but, um, you know, it's not like um, Bieber or somebody, but it's, um, you know, it's respectable. And she posts various different things about clinical things, suicide prevention, uh, pictures of her at conferences, um, you know, Happy New Year stuff. She has a thing here that says, be awesome. And um, you are not alone. She, uh, 11 things you don't realize you're doing uh, because of anxiety, this kind of stuff. She also has a Facebook page that she posts stuff on. And I, I'm guessing she's not making any money. Uh, she doesn't have a YouTube channel. She doesn't have a podcast. Um, but, you know, she has a pretty active and pretty good following on Twitter and her Facebook. And so I'm guessing she might get clients that way. She might get supervisees if she's looking for such a thing. I'm guessing that she does it to feel connected. And she's raising awareness of clinicians, particularly marriage and family therapists. She is learning things, I'm guessing, because she has to read articles to post and that kind of stuff. She looks like she's having fun, and I think she's making the world a better place. So I'm guessing she spends probably, you know, uh, half an hour a day, if that, and uh, she gets all these things out of it. And I think if you're out there and you are think, well, I don't want to do a whole YouTube channel or a podcast or... And I don't want to spend that much time on it, but you know, I think I think it can be done. The third example I want to talk about is Jordan Peterson. <laughs> so, in prep for this um, episode, I uh, was trying to find uh, examples of prominent clinicians who are using social media successfully, and I already knew about Kitty Morton, so uh, she popped into my head. And then I had to look on Twitter to find other um, counselors who were using Twitter well, and I came across Christy Labardi. Um, but then I was like, well, I want a third example. And I, I was like thinking and thinking, and then all of a sudden I was like, well, wait a second. Jordan Peterson essentially is someone who was just like us, who started using social media and is and has a huge audience. Now, you know, I know a lot of you, It's a it's, he's a very polarizing figure, if you're not familiar with him, um, he is essentially seen as a right-wing uh, pundit or proponent of sort of backward, sexist, um, anti-trans ideas. But let's put aside his politics. I swore to myself I was never going to talk about him again on this podcast. So um, I'm breaking that promise, but... Uh, I'm just going to keep it to his career side. So this is all gathered from the internet and it's all, um, I could, some of it could be wrong, but um, from what I can tell, I think this is what's happened. So he started out as a regular clinician. He got his degree in 91. He started a practice. He started teaching at a university. And for many years, he was just a regular clinician who taught at a university. He had a, he had a practice. He, he was, you know, just, just essentially like same career as I did before I started my podcast. And then in about uh, 2013, he started posting his lectures on YouTube. And they were basically that boring type, you know, the pre-Katie Morton type, where he would be lecturing to a bunch of um, students who look extremely bored, by the way. And there's a video camera on a tripod filming him talk. And so he might be talking about social psychology issues or about um, how to be a clinician or about PTSD or about ADHD or something. You know, he's just lecturing about, you know, just typical psychology courses stuff. Um, and no one was watching Jordan Peterson and no one cared about him. He was just another one of those boring um, lecture YouTube videos on YouTube. Then in 2016, he uh, started to speak out against this um, this bill in Canada that was supposedly for trans rights. And he became, uh, he had a little bit of fame because of that. So um, 
because he was a psychologist and a instructor at you know a professor in Canada he um, he was among a lot of people who added to the debate in Canada over this over this bill bill c16 I think it was um, and uh, you know a little bit of fame but you know not a tremendous amount but after that he really capitalized on that little bit of media attention that he was getting um, he made sure that his podcast you know had a podcast he made that very popular um, he made sh- you know he, he probably spent a lot of time in that podcast he uh, really amped up his activity on YouTube and started making better and better YouTube videos he started using Twitter a lot better and now he has like a million followers. Uh, this year he he published a book 12 Rules for Life. Um, I haven't read it but I'm gonna take a guess and say that it's not a mind-blowing book. <laughs> I mean anytime you're talking about like you know 12 rules for life, I can't imagine it being um, that mind-blowing. I don't know maybe it's an maybe it's an awesome book I don't know but um, I guarantee but it is now, Amazon's best-selling nonfiction book this year. So Jordan Peterson's book, 12 Rules for Life, is the best-selling nonfiction book of the year on Amazon. And I guarantee you, he would not have sold very many copies if he wasn't using social media effectively. He has a Patreon page where he, he, I'm according, I can't really tell how much he's making on Patreon, but um, a low estimate is he's making a million dollars per year on just from Patreon. He gives talks in which he, he regularly sells out um, his talks. He, he gives talks in stadiums sometimes and, uh, or large auditoriums, and he sells those out. So to, uh, again, putting aside his politics, if we just look at his um, usage of social media and the Internet, he has his practice still, from what I can tell. He's teaching still, from what I can tell. He has a strong YouTube channel. He has a strong website, a strong Twitter uh, Facebook he uses. He has merch on his website. He has a strong Patreon. He gets hired as a speaker. He sells a self-help program. He has books and other kinds of things. Um, again, uh, I tried to figure out, estimate how much money I think Jordan Peterson is making. And I'm guessing he probably spends, um, it's probably a full-time job, what he's doing, all the extra things he's doing beyond his practice and his university. I don't know how he finds the time, but he, it's probably full-time work, and I'm estimating at the low end, he's probably making about $200,000 per month. So it's it's something like $2.5 million Jordan Peterson is making just mainly from his Patreon page and his YouTube page. But, but really, uh, half, I think, of his revenue is coming from Patreon. Um, obviously, selling books makes him money, and s- selling his speaking engagements making money. So he could be making much more than that. He could be making $5 million a year for all I know. Um, and that doesn't include how much money he's making from his practice and his university work. Um, and the reasons that uh, I, if I were in his shoes, I suppose that um, I'd be getting out of what Jordan Peterson is doing is um, if he wants to, he could be getting clients and supervisees. I'll, I'm guessing he's full. He's promoting his stuff. He's making money. He's getting connected. I'm thinking he's learning things. Uh, uh, in terms of fun, I don't know if he's having fun. It doesn't look like he's having fun, but maybe he's having fun. And according to him, I think he thinks he's making the world a better place. So, and I just want to remind everyone, especially for you people who know this guy, uh, prior to 2016, or you know, especially when you go back to 2013 and stuff, he was just like us. He was he was just a clinician um, with opinions, but but no one to tell him to, and. Uh, he was. If you're if you're out there and you're a clinician, especially if you're a clinician and a teacher, and you're not on social media or you haven't used it very much, Jordan Peterson five years ago was just like you. The only difference is he figured out how to use the internet and social media to build an audience, and through that audience, he has you know risen in power and prominence, and you know is making a good living off of it too. And and he's starting all these different projects that he thinks are making the world a better place. Um, and so, so that's that example. So in the presentation, I'm going to ask for questions at this point. 
So again, if you have questions, email me, contact at psychologyinseattle.com. Okay, so I'm going to end with my 10 keys to using social media to enhance your clinical practice. Number one is to know why you're doing it and make sure you're committed. Uh, if you know why you're doing it, it'll give you direction, it'll give you meaning. Plus, doing this sort of thing can be quite time consuming. I mean, even for Chrissy Labardi, who appears to be just doing Twitter and Facebook, um, doing a, uh, you know, doing social media stuff, it's time consuming. And unless you know why you're doing it, it'll be hard to sustain that. Also, building an audience can take years. I mean, for me, I don't think my audience really began to grow until like seven or eight years into it. And so you need some reason as to why you're doing it. You know, Christy Labardi has 5,000 followers on Facebook. It's, that's not a lot of people. So she must have a reason for moving forward. You know, there, there has to be some purpose to it all. Um, also, you might not get a lot of praise. There might not be a lot of people who praise you for what you're doing, you know, not a lot of feedback. And so you, you might just, the first couple of years I did this podcast, I got basically no praise or very little of it anyway. And, but, you know, I was getting all these other needs met. And so I didn't really care. Um, number two is to know your platform and to provide regular content. So you need to know your platform. So if you're going to be a Twitter person, you need to be a consumer of Twitter. Um, for example, for me, I don't use Twitter. I don't, I don't consume Twitter. I'm not a Twitter, uh, you know, sort of person. And therefore, I don't use Twitter as part of our social media thing because I don't get it. <laughs> like whenever I, you know, I, I feel like we should have a Twitter page. And so we have one. And every time I dip into it, I'm like, um, I don't even understand what I'm looking at half the time. You know, why am I getting all these different things that... I'm sure it's not that hard. I'm sure you Twitter people out there are like, you know, face palming right now at my idiocy. But anyway, my point is, is that um, you want to know your platform. So with podcasts, when I started my podcast, I had already listened to hundreds of hours of podcasts prior to me starting my podcast. And throughout the 10 years of making my podcast, I've continued to listen to hundreds of hours, thousands of hours um, of podcast. Um, <laughs> this is a little embarrassing, but... I, uh, my podcast app on my phone keeps track of how many hours I spend listening to podcasts. And these are like the legit hours. I don't fall asleep to listening to podcasts or anything. So these are actually me listening to podcasts. I spent, um, God, I can't remember how much it was, but it was something like a month and a half of, of uh, time listening to podcasts over last year. So, so, so if you think, of, so I remember it's like, okay, you know, a third of your life, you're asleep, right? So if you take 12 months, you're basically sleeping for four months. That's kind of a trip when you think about that, right? Every year you sleep for the, for the amount of time of four months. <laughs> um, so take out four months right there. So you only have eight months of being awake. And then of those eight months, it was something like, it could have been as, as much as two months. Man. Let's just say one month. Um, it was definitely more than a month of time. And so I, I was basically spending a seventh or an eighth, I suppose, an eighth of my awake hours listening to podcasts. And I believe it because when I'm doing laundry, when I'm mowing the lawn, when I'm driving in my car, when I'm uh, playing a video game or something, when I'm going to the bathroom, let's be real here, <laughs> when, um, when I'm in the shower, I'll, I'll put it on a speaker when I'm making coffee, when I'm doing the dishes, when I'm at the grocery store, you know, when I'm at the mall or something, you know, I'm listening to podcasts that entire time. <laughs> so it's basically anytime I'm not talking to someone and I'm awake and I, and I don't need to necessarily be paying attention to, to something, then I'm listening to podcasts. So my point with that is that, um, the, the, by that fact that I'm a massive consumer of podcasts, it makes it so that I know the form well so that I can actually produce my own podcast that um, is in line with the conventions of making a podcast. You know, you'll learn uh, from, from that. You know, if, if you are going to be in a metal band and you never listen to metal music, you know, it's probably not going to go very well. 
The other thing is, is to have regular content, uh, to, you know, knowing your platform. So uh, there are podcasts that I listen to, or, you know, there's YouTube channels that I follow. And if they don't have regular content enough, I find that I lose interest in them, you know? It, so you need, you need regular content. Uh, you need it to be regular and it needs to be to the form. So for Twitter, for example, you need to, you know, tweets need to be short, easy to understand kind of stuff. And maybe one to three times a day, uh, could be less, could be more depending on your kind of deal. Um, and you don't want to do it too much cause you don't want to seem thirsty on YouTube. I would say about once a week, again, depending on the sort of videos, if you're doing deep dives on certain things, then you could probably get away with doing once a month or something. But if you're a clinician like Kitty Morton, she, she appears to do it every other day. Um, Facebook, similar to Twitter, once a day. Pinterest, I have no idea because I don't use Pinterest. Uh, Tumblr, I have no idea. Podcast, I would say, you know, probably once a week, maybe once every other week, but I think once a week is good. I do this podcast about every other day. Um, over the years, I have found that listeners, that's what they want. Some people don't want that much content, but some people do. And so I, I always figure like, well, uh, f- for those who don't want that much content, they can skip over episodes. And for those who do, then, you know, this meets their needs. Plus, I j- I'll just tell you that I have so many things I want to talk about on the podcast and so many people I want to talk to about things, so many interviews I want to do that, um, honestly, I don't really care if people <laughs> don't want it every other day because I have so many things I want to do. (laughs) I mean, that's a whole other part of the podcast. It's just like, it's kind of a selfish thing to me of just like, it's just fun to make things or to research things or to talk to people about things. And so it's like, well, might as well record it and put it up on the internet. Um, Blogging. I haven't talked about blogging yet. You can have people absolutely follow blogs on the internet and on their phones. And uh, I would say about once a week ish, but it kind of depends on your content. LinkedIn, people use LinkedIn for some weird reason (laughs) for social media. Uh, Not really sure how you use LinkedIn. Um, Reddit is actually a pretty good way you can use, you know, it's it's not, I don't know if it's technically social media, but Reddit is a place where you can absolutely build an audience. You can, if you know how to use it well, you can interact with people right away. You can... Uh, there's a there's a fair amount of clinicians on Reddit of various different f- professions who are actually dispelling a lot of myths. If you go to like a certain sites where certain subreddits where they're talking about technical things, you will find some of the most glorious technical answers to questions. You know, there since I'm really into uh, astrophysics, astronomy. Um, I follow pages, subreddits where they're talking about this sort of thing. And, you know, someone will just ask this random question. They'll just be like, so I don't get gravity. Can you explain it like I'm five years old? And then someone will, uh, some massive, you know, double doctorate, top of his or her field will uh, explain gravity in like, you know, 10 sentences. And, and you'll just, and then that will be upvoted because people upvote comments. And so the best comments end up being the ones that you see. And it's just like, man, that person, that person must be just a super freaking expert on gravity. And for us, uh, there are people like us on the internet right now on Reddit and they're responding to things. And I think, you know, you can build an audience that way. Um, and Instagram, uh, I would say about once a day depending. Uh, I don't really get Instagram. I mean, I sort of get it, but it just feels like sort of Facebook light in some ways. I know people like Instagram because of that, but so I don't really use Instagram because I just feel like, can't I just do it on Facebook? Because there's everything that Instagram does, you can do on Facebook, but you can't do everything on Facebook on Instagram. And so I'm just like, ah, I, I just, you know, I don't know. Um, so, and there's other kinds of platforms to get to know. But the point is, is that um, to know the platform and to match your content uh, frequency to that platform, because and you want to make sure that you keep that up. And I say that because a lot of people ask me sometimes, they'll, they'll see me doing a podcast and they'll be like, huh, I could do that. And they're like, I'm going to do that. And then 
they proceed to make a podcast episode once every three months or something. And they're like, how come no one's listening? And I'm like, well, one, um, you know, the main thing here, I don't know about your content, but the main thing is, it's like, you don't have any regularity. Like people don't, people forget about you, <laughs> you know, and it's, it, you, you need to be a regular part of their life. Essentially. You need to be like, um, like the podcasts I listen to, the people are a part of my life. Like there's a local podcast called TBTL and they do a podcast every day. And it's one of my favorite podcasts and they just talk about nothing. <laughs> There's just like, you know, two guys chatting on, on the microphones and they're not clinicians. They're just, you know, regular dudes. And so it's, it's, um, and I feel like they're a part of my life. Um, I've met them at that. I met them actually, cause my podcast was associated with Kyra radio for a while. And so, so was their podcast. And so, um, that's how I found out about the podcast anyway. Um, but, you know, they barely know me and I know them really well. And I look forward to the podcast. So it's that regularity you want. If you're on Twitter, people end up liking certain figures on Twitter. It's like, oh, I wonder what that person has to say about this, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, number three is don't expect to get paid at first. Um, you need to make sure you're doing it for other reasons because there's a chance you won't get paid at first, if ever. Number four is experiment. You want to trial and error, uh, being experimenting will be your friend. You want to listen to feedback. You also cannot be perfectionistic about this sort of stuff. If you are a perfectionist, you will be paralyzed and you won't actually post anything. And I find that's a major barrier for some people. They want it to be perfect. And it's like, it'll never be perfect. Just fucking post it. <laughs> um, if I if I needed everything to be perfect before I posted it, I would never post anything. Um and no one really expects per perfection. And even if you did perfect it, I guarantee you uh, the same group of people who will hate what you're doing will still hate it, you know, or they'll pick it apart in some other way. They might even say it's too perfect, for example. Uh, number five is be narcissistic uh, in a good way. Don't be shy. Believe in yourself. Believe that you have something to offer. I can't tell you how many times I am talking with a student or a instructor, colleague, and I'm like, my God, this person needs to have a podcast or this person needs to be on YouTube. And I'm just thinking, you know, this person is a super expert on domestic violence or this person is a super expert on, you know, hoarding like Jennifer Sampson, who, whom I've had on the podcast. Um, someone's a super expert on couples therapy or a super expert on um, self-esteem or something. And I'm like, do you know how badly the internet needs you and uh, how, how there's nothing on the internet like this right now? And I'm, and I'm just thinking, you need to have your podcast. And they'll be like, nah, who wants to hear me? And I'm like, man, you do not understand. Uh, there are people out there who want to hear from you. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, particularly if you're a clinician, I think um, you have a lot to offer. And I, I recommend getting out there. Number six is provide useful content. This is very important. I've seen people just kind of splatter random content rather than thinking, what do people need? What do they actually want? That's important to know. It's a it's subtle art, but it's important to pay attention to. Number seven is establish a brand. You don't want to be general. I've listened to podcasts where it was just called like, I don't know, there's one back in the day called like Psychology History or this day in psychology history or something. And the podcast was so general and, and you didn't really know who was in charge of it or, you know, who, there was no personality to it. And so you, you want to establish a brand, you know, Katie Morton, for example, she is, uh, her face is right up in the camera. She lets her personality shine. And, um, you know, you definitely get an idea of the Katie Morton brand, you know. You need to have a voice, for example. So if you're tweeting, you want the tweets to exhibit some of your personal, your, your, your characteristics, your personality. It's a, again, it's an art form. So don't be distant from it. You, you want to be involved, you know, like with this podcast, I definitely let my personality shine through. I don't let my whole personality shine through, but I, I let, you know, some of it shine through. And it's because people respond to things that are personal. Plus, honestly, it's a lot funner that way too. You know, it's 
to do something like very business like is not very fun. To to make it personal makes it a lot more fun. Number eight is to use pop culture and clickbait. I know people hate clickbait, but I think it actually can help sometimes, uh, particularly on Twitter and these kinds of podcasts. It's not as important, but um, YouTube things that so you know because podcasts it's like someone subscribes to the podcast. There you know it doesn't matter what you title it or anything they'll listen to the episodes, but. On YouTube, um, you're often competing with billions of other uh, click clickable things. Uh, same, you know, on Twitter, it's a similar thing. So you want to have things like, you know, five ways that people screw up their lives or 10 ways that people save, you know, 10, 10 ways you can, 10 things you can do to save your marriage. Now, I know it's super cliche and so, super effed out, but... Um, I think it, I think it, or it's, you know, something pithy, something real quick that people understand. Um, you know, people in my field are very used to extremely long, uh, titles. Like my dissertation was called seasoned psychotherapists experience with difficult clinical moments. And honestly, that dissertation title is probably on the short end of things. Dissertation titles are in my anecdotal uh, evidence is, you know, 50%, 100% longer than that and equally and equally indecipherable, you know? So people in, in our field are, are used to titling things like extremely accurately. And in this, in, in the internet world, you can't do that because one, it's too long and two, no one will get what you're talking about. And so it has to be real short. Um, so that's another, that's, that's another tip for you. <laughs> Um, and of course you just want to, you don't want to do too much clickbaity kinds of things because people will start to get annoyed with it. But also you want to use pop culture. Um, you know, for example, I, uh, randomly decided to do an episode a number of years ago about Joffrey Baratheon on Game of Thrones. I was, I loved Game of Thrones. Like I said, I, you know, listened to the books on, on tape, uh, years ago. And when the show came out, I was like, oh my God, this is great. And I didn't really know anyone was watching the show because I, you know, I loved the show, but I, at the, you know, two or three seasons in, it wasn't that popular with the, with the, you know, general population. But I thought, you know, it would be kind of fun to do an episode about Joffrey Baratheon. And I just did it kind of on a lark. I was experimenting. And uh, as I do with a lot of things on the podcast and, you know, and I thought, you know, I'll post this and I'm sure it'll just be another episode that people forget. But there was such a response to that episode. Um, for, for those of you who are into Game of Thrones, you probably get it. But um, for those of you who don't, you know, there's, there's so, the, the um, George R. R. Martin's, the world is just so rich and so interesting that there's just so much to talk about. And the characters are so vivid. And so there, there's so much background that he gives to this, these characters that uh, it makes for an interesting uh, analysis case. And so I got, you know, tons of feedback from that episode. And so I, you know, made a couple more and got even more feedback. And then I started getting contacted by journalists and people from around the world who didn't really care about my podcast, but they just cared about, um, you know, those, just those episodes. So out of, I've made almost 800 episodes and they're only concerned with like four of them and, and the ones on Game of Thrones. I even got contacted by some um, TV people in California who wanted me to be on their TV show to talk about Game of Thrones regularly. Um, I didn't really want to do that because it, it just seemed, um, uh, I don't know, just seemed like a waste of time. But anyway, um, so when you use pop culture, uh, so, but so there's some people who are only concerned with the Game of Thrones episodes, but a lot of people, they'll find the Game of Thrones episode because they're into Game of Thrones. And then they'll be like, huh, I wonder what else this dude is putting out. And then that's how they discover you. Um, so pop culture is a good way to get people to discover your product. Um, you know, hashtags, this kind of thing. Number nine is don't get concerned about equipment. I can't tell you how many times I've been trying to encourage someone to start a podcast or start a YouTube channel. And they're like, well, I don't really have, I don't have professional equipment. I mean, I've been dealing with this since like, um, I don't know, for 10 years, really. You know, I'd be at my university and I'd be like, we need to start a YouTube channel for the university because there's so many awesome things that are happening at this university. There's so many 
glorious stories of clinicians who are saving people's lives literally and professors who are making a difference in the community. And we need to be like documenting this shit. And my university would be like, well, you know, we don't really have the best cameras and okay, well, let's, let's make a budget and buy microphones. I'm like, no, like just get a crappy ass camera and record it and post it. Like why, why are you getting super, I mean, everyone, the, people in, and I'm guessing younger, there's a lot of younger clinicians now, but back 10 years ago, most all my colleagues were 20 years older than me and they all kind of saw media as something that only news stations could do. You know, you needed to have like top of the line cameras and, you know, top of the line microphones and interesting backgrounds and basically what, and, and sometimes they would actually, so my university actually did invest in some of that equipment and the videos were terrible. Um, they were poorly directed, um, poorly edited. The backgrounds looked really bland and boring. So what I tell people is, you all have the equipment you need in your pocket. Your smartphone is a extremely powerful video camera, one. And two, you know, records audio pretty well. You know, it's not the best quality, but it it's probably, especially if you're just doing YouTube videos, honestly. Like, you, if you just put your phone uh, on a selfie stick, you're probably fine. So don't get concerned about equipment. If, if, that, if you're considering that a barrier to entry, um, don't worry about that. Um, and my last key to success in using social media to enhance your clinical practice is have a system to cope with mean people. You know, as you all know, if you listen to the podcast, I complain about mean people on the internet, particularly on YouTube. And um, I just have a couple <laughs> comments here that I saved, um, recent comments um, that I, I'll include here. One person said, Babbling millennials, no professionalism or wisdom. So in this one, this, this comment's kind of interesting because it's like, okay, I'm babbling, I'm not professional, I'm not wise, but I'm a millennial? Like, I'm 47 years old. I'm pretty far from being a millennial. Um, so maybe they're saying I sound young. Anyway, so that's one. And then another one here. Mr. Psychology in Seattle, you are full of shit. And shit is all capital. So they really want me to kind of feel that word. Mr. Psychology in Seattle, you are full of shit. You know, so there's that kind of, and of course, no follow up to that. No, like, this is why I think you're full of shit. Or when you said this, this was wrong. And whenever I, you know, reply back to stuff like that, I'm like, so what did I say that bothered you? And they'll just be like, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's just useless conversations. It's, it's never, never worked out. Now, if someone says like, I disagree with this, you know, when you said this, I, th I see it this way. I'm like, okay, you know, I can get down with that. But, um, these, you know, these kind of one liners, you know, you're full of shit. It, it never works out right. In fact, I would say, 80% of the time, even when someone is seemingly sane um, and I start interacting with them, they quickly escalate. There's just a lot of really angry, aggressive people on the internet, but on YouTube. I'm mainly talking about YouTube at this point. Um, in fact, I think I'm only talking about YouTube. Occasionally I get emails that are mean, but I probably don't actually. Um, I can't, can't remember the last time I got an email that was in this sort of category. Yeah, it's just basically YouTube. YouTube is just full of of um, this sort of thing. It's awful. It's an awful, awful place, YouTube. Um, another uh, th uh, comment here. You sound stupid. And the U is just a letter U. It's all lowercase. You sound stupid. <laughs> so, um, you know, it's like, okay, I sound stupid, but I might not be stupid. But anyway. Yeah, there's a lot of trolls, misogynists, racists, and literal sadists, psychopathic sadists who get off on hurt, hurting other people on the internet and particularly on YouTube, apparently. And my advice for this is one, be ready for it. If, if, you, if you're not ready for it, it can be quite shocking. So just expect it to happen. And two, try to develop a tough skin. Three, just block people. If people are being abusive or misogynistic or, you know, they're using the N word or something like just, just block them. You know, you, you don't, the, the, the way I always think about it is that if, if I was giving a talk and someone, you know, I'm giving a lecture at a, you know, town hall 
And someone stands up in the middle of my talk and starts spouting, you know, stuff about the N-word or about the Illuminati or Trump or something. I mean, what am I supposed to do? Am I supposed to just like listen to that person? Or am I supposed to be like, can security escort this person out of the room? Like they're not making any sense. I mean, if they if they want to engage in in a conversation, then great. But the way that they're ranting, it's not a conversation. Um, now, if you want to, if if a troll wants to start their own YouTube channel and they want to rant and rave about the Illuminati and Trump and whatever, and about Jordan Peterson or whatever, they they can do that. Um, but not during my talk. You know, <laughs> like I this is my presentation. You, you can't just stand up and start yammering, you know? The other thing is, is if someone came up to you at, you know, you're lecturing and you, you know, you're on a book tour or something and you talked about your book and at the end of the book uh, reading, someone walks up to you and just says, you sound stupid. And that's all they said. You know, they just look, uh, you sound stupid. Like, would you regard that comment? Would you be like, oh, that hurts my feelings. You'd be like, uh, something's wrong with this person. <laughs> like, it's such a, such a weird, you know, maybe I did sound stupid, but that's not the way you communicate, right? There's, when you communicate so badly, it indicates there's something wrong with that person. And there's a lot of things wrong with people on YouTube <laughs> and on the internet in general. There's just a lot of you know, there's a lot of roads to wrongness. There's a lot of roads to, you know, weird comments. And so, so I just don't take it seriously. Again, if someone wants to engage with me, you know, and certainly there are things that people will say that are legitimate criticisms of me. Um, you know, there's just a, a billion things you could criticize about me or refute that I say or have a different opinion or whatever. Um, absolutely. And I have interactions like that all the time. But when people just comment, you know, Mr. Psychology in Seattle, you are full of shit. Like what, what are you talking? Like, which, what I say lots of things, like, what are you pointing to that I'm, that I'm full of shit about, (laughs) you know? And I suspect a lot of it honestly is political things. You know, it's like I lean left. And so I will talk about things in that voice. And so uh, I'm guessing it has to do with that. I don't know. But um, uh, anyway, so a way to cope with mean people on the internet, you have to have it. And um, that's my advice, you know, be ready for it, develop a tough skin, block people. Um, cons- don't regard really mean comments at all. And I get them every day on YouTube, just every day, just like these, this onslaught of just like, and, you know, people say like, well, you know, just ignore it. And I'm just like, well, I don't think you understand like the way some comments are. Like some comments are like, um, some comments are, they'll start sane. And so I'll be like, oh, okay, this person sounds sane. I'll, I'll read this. And then it'll just kind of slowly um, edge into aggressive abuse of me. And I'll be, and before I know it, I've sort of let that sort of into my soul. And um, it's very destructive. And I, I've actually paid attention to a lot of other um, uh, public figures. And whenever they talk about this sort of thing, uh, I think a lot of people, like some, a lot of people, honestly, from what I can tell what they do is they just completely don't pay attention to it at all. They just don't read it. You know, there are people public, like, um, like the podcast TBTL, for example, um, the two guys on that podcast, from what I understand, they don't, they don't look to the internet. There's a lot of people posting comments on Facebook and other places and they just don't even regard it. They're just like, I, I just don't go there. You know, I I don't know why, but I suspect that it has something to do with this. Um, also you want to vent to other people, like what I'm doing right now, I'm venting to you all. (laughs) I am expressing my feelings. And so when you get these kinds of comments, make sure you have a support system around you to vent with. So that's, so that's my 10th key to success in in using social media. Um, And then I'm going to end the presentation by asking people if anyone in the audience is considering a social media venture. And I'm going to talk with them about how to do that and, and what they plan on doing. And so that is my presentation called Using Social Media to Enhance Your Clinical Practice, in which I am giving a talk tomorrow morning at the Washington Association of Marriage and Family Therapy. 
That does it for that episode of Psychology in Seattle. Thanks for joining me. Please take care of yourself because you deserve it. (laughs) 